Okay, so we're starting a new book today. Um, it is called Wish. I thought this was a good one. I like it. Um, I just read it for the first time this summer, actually. So let me make it big full screen. Um, we're going to try to read, yeah, the first two chapters. They're pretty short. Um, so, chapter one. Oh, this is the cover. All right. Chapter one. I looked down at the paper on my desk, the getting to know you paper. At the top, Mrs. Willoughby had written Charlemagne Reese. I put a big X over Charlemagne and wrote Charlie. My name is Charlie. Charlemagne is a dumb name for a girl, and I have told my mama about a gazillion times. I looked around me at all the hillbilly kids doing math in their workbooks. My best friend, Alvina, told me they would be hillbilly kids. You will hate it in Colby, she said. There's just red dirt roads and hillbilly kids there. She had flipped her silky hair over her shoulder and added, I bet they eat squirrels. I glanced at the lunch boxes under the desks around me and wondered if there were any squirrel sandwiches in them. I looked back down at the paper in front of me. I was supposed to fill in all this stuff so my new teacher could get to know me. On the line beside describe your family, I wrote, bad. What is your favorite subject in school? None. List three of your favorite activities, soccer, ballet, and fighting. Two of those favorite activities were lies, but one of them was the truth. I am fond of fighting. My sister Jackie inherited daddy's inky black hair and I inherited his fiery red temper. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard, the apple don't fall far from the tree, I'd be rich. Daddy fights so much that everybody calls him scrappy. In fact, at this very minute, while I'm stuck here in Colby, North Carolina, surrounded by hillbilly kids, old Scrappy is back in Rayleigh in the county jail again because of his fondness for fighting. And I don't need a crystal ball to know that at this very minute in our house in Rayleigh, smack dab in the middle of the day, Mama is in bed with the curtains drawn and an empty soda cans on the nightstand. She will stay in that bed the live long day. If I was there, she wouldn't care one little bit if I went to school or stayed on the couch watching TV and eating cookies for lunch. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, the social services lady said when she rattled off a list of reasons why I was getting shipped off to this sorry excuse for a town to live with two people I don't even know. It's better to stay with kin, she told me. Gus and Bertha are kin. What kind of kin, I asked. She explained how Bertha is Mama's sister and Gus is her husband. She said they didn't have any kids and they were happy to take me in. And how come Jackie gets to stay with Carol Lee? I asked about a million times. Carol Lee is Jackie's best friend. She lives in a fancy brick house with a swimming pool. Her mama gets out of bed every morning and her daddy is not called Scrappy. So that lady told me again how Jackie was practically a grown up and would be graduating from high school in a couple of months. When I pointed out that I was in fifth grade and not exactly a baby, she sighed and smiled a fake smile and said, Charlie, you have to live with Gus and Bertha for a while. I'd never laid eyes on those people and now I was supposed to live with them? When I asked how long I had to be there, she said until things settled down and mama got on her feet or got her feet on the ground. Well, how hard is it to put your dang feet on the ground is, is what I thought about that. You need a stable family environment, she told me, but I knew what she really meant was, you need a family that's not all broken like yours is. Still, I whined and argued and whined and argued, but here I am in Colby, North Carolina, staring down at this getting to know you paper. Have you finished, Charlemagne? Mrs. Willoughby was suddenly beside me. My name is Charlie, I said, and a greasy-haired boy in the front of the class let out a sputtering laugh. I, spent one of my, I sent one of my famous glares his way till he hushed up and turned red. I handed Mrs. Willoughby that paper and watched her eyes dart back and forth as she read it. Her neck got splotchy red and the corners of her mouth twitched. She didn't even look at me before she marched back up to the front of the room and dropped the paper on her desk like it was a hot potato. I slumped down in my seat and wiped my sweaty palms on my shorts. It was only April, but it was already hot as blazes. You want me to help you with that? The boy in the front of me pointed at the math worksheet on my desk. He had red hair and wore ugly black glasses. No, I said. He shrugged, 
took a pencil out of his desk and headed to the pencil sharpener. Up, down, up, down. That's how he walked. Like one leg was shorter than the other. And he dragged one foot along the floor, so his sneaker made squeaking noises. I glanced at the clock. Dang it, I missed 11-11. I have a list of all the ways there are to make a wish. Like seeing a white horse or a blowing a dandelion. Looking at a clock at exactly 11-11 is on my list. I learned that one from some old man who owned the bait and tackle shop out by the lake where Scrappy and I used to go fishing. Now that I'd missed 11-11, I was going to have to find another way to get in my wish for the day. I hadn't missed one single day of making my wish since the end of fourth grade, so I sure didn't want to miss one now. When Mrs. Willoughby nodded toward the red-headed boy sharpening his pencil and said, Howard, why don't you be Charlie's backpack buddy for a while? Mrs. Willoughby explained that when a new kid comes to school, their backpack buddy shows them around and tells them the rules till they get settled. Howard grinned and said, yes, ma'am, and that was that. I had a backpack buddy, whether I wanted one or not. The rest of the afternoon creeped along so slow I couldn't hardly stand it. I stared out the window while kids took turns bragging about their social studies projects. A misty rain had begun to fall and dark gray clouds hovered over the tops of mountains in the distance. When the bell finally rang, I hightailed it out of there and headed for the bus. I hurried up the aisle and dropped into the last row. I kept my eyes on a piece of dried up chewing gum stuck to the seat in front of me while I sent laser thoughts zipping and zapping around the bus. Don't sit next to me, don't sit next to me, don't sit next to me. If I had to be stuck on a bus full of kids I didn't even know, I wanted to at least sit by myself. My laser thoughts seemed to be working, so I took my eyes off the gum and glanced out the window. That red-headed boy with the up-down walk was hurrying toward the bus, his backpack bouncing against him with every step. When he got on the bus, I quickly looked back at the gum and sent my laser thoughts out again. But that boy didn't waste a minute shuffling up the aisle and plopping himself right down next to me. Then he thrust his hand out and said, Hey, I'm Howard Odom. He pushed his ugly black glasses and added, Your backpack, buddy. Now, what kind of kid shakes hands like that? No kid I ever knew. He kept his hand there and stared me down till I couldn't help myself. I shook hands with him. Charlie Reese, I said. Where are you from? Rayleigh. Why are you here? He sure was nosy, but I figured if I laid out the cold hard truth, that would shut him up, and maybe he wouldn't want to be my backpack buddy anymore. My daddy's in jail and my mama won't get out of bed, I said. Well, that boy didn't even blink an eye. What's he in jail for? Fighting. Why? What do you mean? He wiped his fogged up glasses with the bottom of his t-shirt. His face was flushed pink in the damp heat of the bus. Why was he fighting, he said. I shrugged. There was no telling why Scrappy was fighting. Besides, there were probably a bunch of other reasons he was in jail, but nobody ever tells me anything. Gus and Bertha told my mama you were coming. They go to church. They go to my church and I gave them... A cat one time, Howard said, a scrawny gray cat that was living up under my porch. When he got on, then he went on and on about how Gus taught him how to make a slingshot and how sometimes Bertha sells bread and butter pickles by the side of the road in the summer. How his mama drove her car right into the ditch beside Gus and Bertha's driveway one time and Gus pulled it out with a tractor and then they all ate barbecue sandwiches in the front yard. You'll like living with them, he said. I'm not living with them, I told him. I'm going back to Rayleigh. Oh, he looked down at his freckly hands in his lap. When? When my mama gets her feet on the ground. How long does that take? I shrugged. Not long. But the knot in my stomach told me that was a lie. The worry clutching at my heart told me my mama might never get her feet on the ground. As the bus pulled out of the parking lot and headed toward town, Howard rattled off a list of school bus rules. No saving seats, no gum, no writing on the back of the seats, no cussing, a whole mess of rules that I was pretty sure nobody paid mind to except maybe Howard. I looked out the window at the sorry sights of Colby, a gas station, a trailer park, a laundromat. Wasn't much of a town, if you ask me. No malls or movie theaters, not even a Chinese restaurant. Before long, the bus was making its way up the mountain. The rain had stopped and the wavy plumes of steam drifted up off the asphalt. The narrow road curved back and forth and round and round. 
Every now and then, the bus stopped to let some kid off at a pitiful-looking house with a red dirt yard. We were almost to Gus and Bertha's when the bus stopped and Howard said, See ya! Another, younger-looking, red-headed boy got off with him. I watched them make their way across the weed-filled yard to their house. Bikes and skateboards and footballs and sneakers were scattered from the front door to the road. A garden hose snaked from a dripping faucet to the hole in the yard. A small, dirt, dirty-faced boy was dropping rocks into the hole, sending splashes of muddy water. Howard waved as the bus pulled away, but I turned my eyes back to that dried-up gum. When we finally got to Gus and Bertha's, the long driveway, or when we finally got to Gus and Bertha's long driveway, long gravel driveway, I got off and watched the bus drive away, making the rain-soaked Queen Anne's lace bob at the edge of the road. I was staring up the driveway when I noticed something shiny in the dirt at the edge of the road, a penny. I darted over and picked it up, then I hurled it as far as I could and made my wish quick before that penny hit the road and bounced into the woods. There, I'd gotten in my wish for the day. Maybe this time it would finally come true. All right, we are also going to read chapter two. I trudged up the long driveway, jumping over puddles of muddy rainwater and wondering what Jackie was doing right that very minute, probably smoking cigarettes with some boy in the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly across from the high school. Everybody thinks my sister is an angel straight down from heaven, but I know better. When Gus and Bertha's house finally came into view, I stopped. I'd be there. I'd been there for four days already, but I couldn't get over how that house hung off the side of the mountain like it did. The front of the house sat smack on the ground with flowering shrubs nestled right up against it, but the back was on stilts stuck into the steep mountainside. On top of the stilts was a tiny porch with two rocking chairs and a window boxes full of flowers perched on the railing. On my first night in Colby, Gus had dragged a kitchen chair out there for me after supper. Bertha had asked me about a million questions, like, what was my favorite subject in school, and did I have a lucky number? Did I want to go swimming at the Y sometime, and did I like boiled peanuts? But I just mumbled and shrugged till she finally stopped. I was too mad to talk. What was I doing there on that porch with these people I didn't even know? I felt like I had been tossed out on the side of the road like a sack of unwanted kittens. So the three of us sat in silence, watching the sun sink behind the mountain and lightning bugs twinkle off and on among the pine trees. I'd spent the next three days trying to convince Gus and Bertha that it was dumb for me to go to school since it was almost summer. But the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the bus full of hillbilly kids on my way to school. Hey there, Bertha called from the front door as I made my way across the yard. A fat orange cat darted out from behind the garden shed and trotted along beside me. Gus and Bertha had a whole passel of cats, sleeping under the porch, sunning on the windowsills, swatting bees out in the garden. I went inside and dropped my backpack on Gus's tattered easy chair. The smell of warm cinnamon drifted through the kitchen door. I made coffee cake, Bertha said. I wonder why they call it coffee cake. Not a drop of coffee in it. She held the door open for the cat to come in. Oh, I know. I bet, because you're supposed to drink coffee when you eat it, you think? Well, anyways, who cares, right? It had been clear to me from day one that Bertha was a talker, not like her sister, my mama, who went for days without saying a word. It had been, I had been surprised when I saw how much they looked alike, though. Same mousy brown hair, same long, thin fingers, even the same crinkly lines along the sides of their mouth. I sat at the kitchen table and watched Bertha cut a thick slice of coffee cake and put it on a paper towel in front of me. Then she pulled her chair so close to mine or close to mine, and said, Tell me every little thing about your first day, your teacher, the other kids, what your classroom looks like, what you had for lunch, what you did at recess, every little thing. Some girl ate a squirrel sandwich, I said. Bertha's eyebrows shot up. A squirrel sandwich? Are you sure? I licked my finger and pressed it, into, pressed it onto the paper towel to get coffee cake crumbs. I nodded, but I didn't look at her when I said, I'm sure. A small gray cat on the kitchen counter groomed himself. I wondered if that was the one Howard had given them. Bertha picked him up and kissed the top of his head. Charlie don't want cat hair in her coffee cake, Walter. And she gently put him down on the linoleum floor. His tail twitched as he watched a line of tiny ants marching from under the sink to a dark spot of something sticky by the stove. 
And there's an up-down boy in my class, I said. Bertha cocked her head. What in the name of sweet Bessie McGee is an up-down boy? She snapped a brown leaf off the plant on the windowsill and tucked it into her pocket. This boy named Howard who walks up and down like this. I walked like Howard around the kitchen table. Howard Odom, Bertha said. Bless his heart, good as gold that boy is. Don't bat an eye when kids poke fun at him, calling him names like Pogo, she shook her head. I swear, kids can be so mean sometimes. Pogo? Yeah, you know, like a pogo stick. You ought to punch their lights out, I said. That's what I'd do. Bertha widened her eyes at me and shook her head. Not that boy. He wouldn't hurt a fly. All the modems are like that. Good-hearted. Kind of wild sometimes, those brothers of his, but good-hearted. She brushed the crumbs off the table and tossed them into the sink. Shoot, just last week, three of those boys were over here helping Gus replace them boards on the porch that got eat, that got eat up with termites, and they wouldn't take one penny. We sent them home with a burlap bag full of turnips, and they were happy as clams. Turnips? Any kids were who were happy about a bag of turnips must be weird if you ask me. Bertha sat at the table beside me again. So what else, she said. Tell me something else about school. I shrugged. I wasn't going to tell her about the, that getting to know you paper dropped onto Mrs. Willoughby's desk like a hot potato, or about Howard being my backpack buddy. So I just said, nothing. Nothing? Nope. Bertha slapped her hand on the kitchen table. I almost forgot, she said. I got you something. She motioned for me to follow her down the hall to the tiny spare room where I'd been sleeping. Ta-da! She flung her arm out and grinned. I followed her gaze to the narrow bed in the corner. Propped up against the wall were two pillows and pink pillowcases with Cinderella on them. I realized this morning that this, is, this room doesn't look one bit like a little girl's room, Bertha said. So I went down to Big Lots and got those pillowcases. I was going to get the matching bedspread, but it was a double and not a twin. I might go back and get this fluffy pink rug they have if I can get Gus to help me move the bureau. I know I need to get my canning jars out of here, and that old TV don't even work anymore, but she rambled on and on, but I didn't even listen. Cinderella pillowcases? She must think I'm five instead of almost eleven. She sure didn't know much about kids. That afternoon, Jackie called from Rayleigh. She told me how Carol Lee's cousin came to visit and gave her a cashmere sweater she didn't want anymore. And Carol Lee's daddy was teaching her how to drive since Scrappy never would. She said she was thinking about putting blue streaks in her hair and that some boy named Arlo was taking her to a NASCAR race down in Charlotte. She was so busy telling me about her happy life that she didn't even ask me what it was like living in Colby with hillbilly kids who eat squirrel. After we hung up, I went back to my room and laid on the Cinderella pillow and felt sorry for myself. How could Jackie be so happy? It seemed like she didn't even care one little bit about me anymore. I bet Scrappy didn't care about me anymore either. I bet he was so busy playing basketball behind the tall fence at the county jail that he didn't even think about me up here on this mountain in a house full of cats with these people I don't even know. And I knew for sure my mama wasn't thinking about me as she shuffled around the house in her bathrobe all red-eyed and stoop-shouldered. I was definitely going to have to go out on the porch tonight and wait for the first star to come out so I could make my wish again. Maybe two in one day would do the trick. All right, so that is the first two chapters of the book. All I want you to do is just tell me what you think about the book so far. If you have any predictions, if you can make any connections, just your thoughts in general.